good morning and good luck. And welcome to the inaugural pilot episode of Good Luck with Gino. I'm your host, uh, Gino, and uh, here we are, guys. We made it. This is my first podcast um, after years of being pressured and and really, frankly, begged uh, to do a podcast. Um, we're here. I just decided, fuck it. Now is the time. Uh, the streets need me, <laughs> right? And so, uh, yeah, here we are. We're going to go ahead and do it. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the podcast. Good luck. Um, why did I call it good luck? Well, a couple reasons. It could be interpreted good or bad, right? Um, the good being, the good of the good luck being that life is hard and the world is ending, right? And so, uh, we all need a little bit of, uh, a bit of good luck. It's kind of like a good luck, uh, to you on that end. The other way it could be interpreted kind of, you know, I'm a, I'm a prolific shit talker, right? And a sarcastic, uh, king. And so that good luck is kind of like a, oh yeah, you want to, you want to, you want to talk shit to me, you know? Yeah. Good luck. Motherfucker. Yeah. So that's, that's that. Uh, but look, uh, don't read too much into it. All right. It's just, a, it's a catchy title. It's a sexy name and the G and the G with good luck and Gino, it works together. And I'm a bit of a wordsmith. Um, do I, do I need to do an intro for this? I'm trying to think if I feel like if you're listening to the first episode, uh, you probably know a little bit about me. Uh, but if not, uh, I'm a two-time Grammy winning songwriter producer. I've sold over 7 million records. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm a bit of an internet fucking, you know, uh, ninja, right? I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I talk shit. I say, I say it how it is. Uh, and so this is not necessarily going to be a podcast, uh, for children. Uh, no, this episode is not sponsored by Liquid Death. Uh, it could be. Tap in, <laughs> right? Uh, won't be cheap, but I'm, I'm here for, uh, for endorsements. Um, yeah, so we're going to start off this first episode. I'm going to kind of tell you guys uh, what I've been up to. Uh, I've had a very eventful month. Um, I went to Tokyo for my birthday, um, which was crazy. Tokyo's definitely the coolest fucking city that I've been. It's the coolest city ever. It feels like you're in like a anime movie slash in a video game slash just you eat the, the food is nuts. Um, it really makes America feel like a piece of shit, um, to put it eloquently. Everything about Tokyo was so fire. It was clean as, f it was, it was so clean. I mean, you, you feel like, first of all, there's no garbage cans, which is the weirdest shit. Um, because there's no trash anywhere. There's no like litter there's no gar. It's just like everything is fucking spotless. It looks like the first day of school everywhere you go. And and there's no garbage cans. I was curious, so I, I, I looked it up. Turns out like 15 years ago or something, uh, there was a terrorist attack in Japan where um, they like bombed garbage cans. They put like a chemical bomb in a bunch of garbage cans around Tokyo and like 10 people died. And so the government was just like, all right, no more garbage cans. <laughs> they were just like, garbage cans are banned in Tokyo. So they re literally removed all the fucking garbage cans in Tokyo. And everybody just had to take their garbage home. I, you know, can you imagine like Americans like <laughs> just not littering if there's no garbage? I mean, I tell you, me personally... If I, you got, I got about 25 steps when I'm walking with garbage in my hand. And if I don't see a garbage can outside in LA, you know, sorry, you know, I'm not, I'm not walking around holding this garbage in my hands. You know what I'm saying? Um, obviously I'm not talking about like, you know, bags of garbage. I'm talking about like, if I got like a fucking toothpick wrapper, or like a gum wrapper, or, you know, somebody will, will pick it up. I don't know. The earth is fucking toast anyway. As I was saying, Tokyo, spotless, clean, no garbage. You have to, like, go into, you, like, walk in a restaurant and give them your garbage. Like, can you please throw this away for me? And they're like, sure. 
<laughs> of course. And, and that's another thing. Everybody in Tokyo is so goddamn nice. It's like you walk into a store and you know when you like walk in a store in America, like at a retail store, and they're just like, hey, how, how are you? What, what are you looking for? What can I help you with? And it's like, dude, stop fucking selling me. I just walked in. I just walked in. Can I have a second, <laughs> you know, to, to peruse before you just like, hey, what, you know what would look great on you? A switch. It's like fucking chill. And in Tokyo, they greet you that quickly, but it's not like, you know, oh, what can you? It's, it's like, hi, hey. Welcome. You look great. You know? Uh, and then as you're looking around, they kind of like, they kind of follow you. But again, it's not on some like overly selling sell shit. It's like, oh, you should try this. They give you like good suggestions. Like, yo, you would look great in this, in this jacket. No pressure, but meh. And you're like, fuck, I would look great in that jacket. Yeah. Yeah. Let me try that on. And then you try it on. And you do look great in that jacket. And then it's like, all right, here's here's the yen. Um, and because of that, uh, I spent a shitload of money. So, mm. so um, yeah, spent a shitload of money, bought a lot of stuff. Uh, have no self control, as you can see. I like you know I like the finer things in life. So if I go to a place, especially if I'm like, oh, I can't get this in America, bow. Bought a lot of stuff. Another thing, as you're leaving the store, they walk you to the exit. They walk you to the, thank you for shot, thank you. Good, enjoy, and it's like, what the fuck? You're like, you look, you look like, you felt like you made a real life uh, connection and a new friend. And, uh, you know, in America, even when I don't buy stuff, even when I wanted, in America, if you don't buy something, they're like, Fuck you. All right, get the fuck out of my store if you're not buying anything. You know what I mean? That's how it feels anyway. Um, what else? Sushi. Hey. <laughs> Can't even eat sushi here. And LA's got great sushi. I don't know if I can have sushi in LA again. The fish in Japan is insane. I felt like I reached in the fucking river, pulled out a tuna myself, diced it up, and, and ate it straight off the, you know? Every time I ate anywhere, hole in the wall, omakase, didn't matter. Uh, the food was so good. Um, the Wagyu beef was so good. Again, uh, felt like I went to the farm, took the cow myself, okay? Did what I needed to do behind the shed with the shotgun, chopped it up. Mm, so good, okay? And... And what's interesting too, um, about eating in Tokyo, there's not really like a, there's not really middle class prices on food. You either like go to a stand up sushi shop where there's like eight chairs and the chef is in front of you just fucking, what do you want? Boom. What do you want? And, and you're just ordering like hundreds of items of sushi and it's like $17. And you you get the bill and you're like, is it? Did you get everything? It's like an itemized, and you're like, huh? Or you go to an omakase, which is like a traditional Japanese. It's the way the traditional way of eating, uh, you know. And there's the chef there, and there's no menu. It's like you sit down, and he just prepares the meal for you however he wants, and you sit there. And you eat it. And you don't not eat it. You can't not eat it. It's disrespectful and rude as fuck to, like, not eat something. And fortunately, I, I eat pretty much everything. I, I've built up, like, I'm a very cultured eater, you know? Long ago are the days of when I lived in Detroit and I was just eating cheeseburgers and pizza only. I'll eat, you know, I'll eat this sashimi and I'll do the squid and I'll da 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 da, whatever. Shit's fire, you know? And when I'm in another country and I'm sitting in front of this chef who's been, a, you know, a sushi chef for 30 years and he's like a goat and his restaurant is like Michelin star and he's like, he's him. The fuck do I look like not eating something he gives me? 
So you have to eat it. Uh, it's like $400 every time. So that's, that's a bit of a shock um, because, again, first couple of days I'm there, we're doing the sushi spots here, the ramen spots here. It's like pretty cheap. I'm like, oh, food in Japan's great. You get the bill back from the omakase and it's like, oh, <laughs> Yeah, sure. Uh, charge it on the Amex. And so the thing about the food, and uh, I'm going to say this as delicately as I can, the things that I liked, I loved. And it was some of the best food I've ever had, right? Certain tuna sashimis and like octopus this and da 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 but one out of every 10 items was didn't look or taste um, edible or like something I would ever decide. To eat. I would never order these things on the menu, which is kind of the point of omakase. It's like, yo, I've prepared this incredible menu for you. Of, of whatever I think I want you to eat. And they're all like very calculated, well-made, delicious. Di- but like, I'm sorry, I don't want to eat squid guts. You know what I mean? I don't want to eat octopus penis sashimi. You know what I'm saying? And, um, I th- and I think that was a real dish. Maybe not octopus penis, but like some type of genitalia sashimi was something that I had to eat. There was another restaurant we were going to go to, another omakase, but we found out that a part of the the menu that he always, his like signature dish, he grabs a live frog out of a tank, right? Um, And just murders it in front of you. Like just fucking just <laughs> homicide on the frog in front of you. Then he takes out the heart of the frog, like fucking gah, Indiana Jones, gah, and puts the f- frog heart in a shot glass, and the heart is still beating in the shot glass, so it's a... And you gotta drink the frog heart. Okay, so, and it's apparently good for you. So, did not want to do that. Also, that's part one of, then, then, he like cuts the fucking frog open and it just puts it on your plate and it's just like, the frog is just on your plate. You know, just, and you just got to eat, it's frog sashimi. So you're just eating raw frog, like my guy. No. Not eating it, okay? I'm a, again, I'm a cultured eater. You know what I'm saying? But I'm not like fucking Anthony Bourdain. I'm not just going to, I'm not eating a, a frog that was alive 21 seconds ago where the frog blood is still warm. Or no, I guess they're cold blooded because they're reptiles. The frog blood is still cold in the frog. I'm not doing it. So we didn't go there. Anyway getting sidetracked i'm gonna get sidetracked a lot i'm gonna take you on journeys we're gonna you know i got like adhd we're just gonna we're gonna travel when i'm telling stories we're gonna go to a different story sometimes and then we're gonna make our way back and continue on the path i'm like a goosebumps book you know those old goosebumps pick your uh pick your story books that's kind of how it's gonna be with me anyway uh mm, liquid death um Omakase. So yeah, you sit also, it's like two and a half hours. So like don't plan anything after or give yourself like a three hour buffer if you do omakase. Again, you sit down. There's usually like six chairs in the restaurant, and you just go through the menu. And it he'll it's literally like two and a half hours. And also it's so much goddamn food. He just kept feeding you. I went to Tokyo with with my girlfriend, uh, Rhea, who we'll have on the show at some point. Uh, Rhea Raj. She's an awesome uh, superstar, upcoming superstar artist. We went together. And like 60% into the meal, 
we just kind of like looked at each other like, okay, I'm about, are you about ready? We didn't say this, obviously, but we're kind of giving each other the, okay, I'm pretty fucking full. And again, it's sushi, so it's like everything is like one item and it's like this big. And you're like, okay. Hmm. So it doesn't feel like you're eating a lot, but eventually your stomach is like, yo, chill out, my guy. Like, And you're eating every kind of fish. Like he's taking you to the bot. It's, I mean, it's wild. And I don't want to scare you away from doing it. You have to do it. Uh, we did two. One was not as long and was less exotic of dishes. Um, the other one was exceptionally long and was kind of the end of my omakase journey. I don't know if I will do it again. Um, yeah, anyway, that's enough on that. Uh, so after Tokyo, Tokyo was incredible, was there for eight days, a lot of food, a lot of shopping, met some great people. Um, I came back to L.A., for maybe six hours, and then I had to go straight to Vegas. Now, going from Tokyo to Vegas, I imagine, is like if you died and you went to the, you know, whatever it's called, the in-between where you find out if you go to heaven or hell, and St. Peter is like, oh, yeah, Gino, Gino Bori, okay, yeah, no, looks like you're good, you're going to heaven, and he, like, takes you up to heaven and then right as you get to heaven and you kind of like open the door into heaven and you're like, wow, this place is fucking, this is nice. He gets a call and he's like, yeah, what's up? Yeah, I'm with them right now. Oh. Oh. You're sure? You're sure? Okay. Yeah, okay. I'll tell him. And then he hangs up and then he goes, hey, um, <laughs> so there's been a mix up. Um, there was actually another Gino that died right around the time you died. Uh, ironically, his last name, very similar to yours. Yeah, so he made it to heaven. So, so you actually didn't make it. Um, and unfortunately, we, it's, and so we needed, yeah, so we needed to actually take you to hell. So then... You go, then you're like, oh, fuck, this sucks. You go down the hell elevator, or maybe it's an escalator. It's probably an escalator. I would imagine it's an escalator. You're going down the escalator, and it's just getting nicer and nicer and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse, and then you're in hell. And that's kind of like what going from Tokyo to Vegas was like. Tokyo, beautiful, paradise, amazing, everything's clean, everyone's nice, it's great. Vegas, Sodom and Gomorrah. Right, Vegas. Vegas is um, Elvis. Right, Vegas is a shithole, but it's a it's a LED it's an LED lit up bright shithole shit. You know, um, I went for a bachelor party. Vegas. If you haven't been to Vegas, you have to go once. I do not recommend more than three days. You will, hmm, how do I say this? Do not go for more than three days. You might not make it back with money or your dignity or anything of that nature. Now, I'm a Vegas expert. I'm a Vegas veteran. You understand? I live in LA. It's like a 25 minute walk to Vegas, basically, right? So it was a lot of fun. Um, I mainly just lost a bunch of money gambling. All my friends are just degenerate gamblers like myself. Um, got cracked at the casino. Um, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, now, something I'm ashamed to say, but I really have took it on the chin and owned it. Uh, I flew... I flew Spirit to Vegas. <sighs> now, I'm a bougie fuck, you understand? I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm a fucking, I'm from Detroit. I'm from the blue collar, the motor city. I've been in LA for nine years. I'm a fucking, I'm as LA as you could ever be now. I'm a bougie, pristine. My nails are fucking manicured. You understand? I'm a, I haven't flown spirit in seven years. I always fly Delta or American. Okay. Fuck American. But I always fly at least that cap. I'll spend the extra money because I, it's just not worth it 
Spirit is a is as advertised. Okay? But I got back from Japan and I realized, oh, hey, dickhead, you didn't book your flight. Hey, dickhead, you got a flight to book. You got to be in Vegas in eight hours. So I'm looking at the prices and, you know, airline, airline uh, websites, they, uh, they know that you're desperate. I don't know if it's the cookies or what. Okay. okay. <laughs> Here we go on a journey. Cookies. Why the fuck... Every time I go on a website now, I got to accept cookies or manage my cookies or go through the terms of service of the cookies of every goddamn website that I go on. I guess Congress signed some bill called the fucking Inconvenience Me Act or something where now companies have to ask for your cookies. They have to ask your permission for your cookies now. What the fuck, dude? I mean, take them. And that's you go you go to like delta.com and it's like we value here at delta.com. We value your privacy. Would you like to grant accept cookies or manage cook? I don't give a fuck about my cookies. Just take my goddamn cookies so I can get to work on your website. You're already about to pillage me for absorbent amounts of money for air travel because you've monopolized it. Because all the airlines got together and they're like, hey, fuck these people, right? $800 to fly from fucking, you know? Now you want to, like, make me read a thing? So anyway, I accepted the cookies. I gave them my cookies. Too much money. It was like $900 to go from LA to Vegas. It's an hour flight. I'm not doing it. I'm not checking a bag. I'm not doing it. So reluctantly, I flew Spirit. I chose Spirit. And uh, it was still a shitload of money because you go to buy your ticket and it's like, oh, $250. That's pretty solid for a flight in eight hours. But then it's like, are you carrying a bag? You got a carry on? That's going to be another $80. Oh, you want some water on the flight? <laughs> well, that's going to be another $10. Oh, you want to choose your seat? Sure. It's going to be $40. Or you can just sit in the fucking middle in the back of the tin can on our shit aircraft that was built 38 years ago that barely works. So I flew Spirit and, uh, you know, what a welcome to Vegas. A flight. To Vegas on Spirit. You can imagine who was on the flight. It was a circus. and uh, But I got to say, I had a good time. Uh, it was an hour. So really, not a lot can go wrong in an hour. Um, what's funny also about Flying Spirit, everybody you talk to is like, I mean, I normally don't fly Spirit, but yeah, I mean, I had to fly Spirit. because Yeah, yeah, but this is, oh, this is my, actually my first time flying Spirit. And you, everyone is just like apologizing. Uh, and begging you to think that they're not broke. They're like, I mean, I, I never fly spirit, but here, here I am. Um, anyway, um, so that's that on that. That's been my week. I'm back in LA and I'm filming a fucking podcast. Huh? Here we are. Um, and uh, we're going to do these weekly also. Ideally, hopefully, um, I don't get distracted and busy, but you know, I'm a busy guy. Um, so... I've had a lot of people ask me recently. I posted something on my on my Instagram story yesterday about this, uh, and it got a lot of uh, got a lot of buzz. Right, I somehow made my way through the Instagram algorithm hell and made it out alive. And uh, my followers actually saw my post this time, and got a lot of feedback. I had a question, you know, from a friend of mine back home who's not in the music business, and they asked me, "Why do so many?" new artists uh, fail. You know, why Why do new artists who, they'll have a hit, they'll have two hits, and they get signed, and all of a sudden, you never hear from them again. They fade into oblivion. They either don't put out music, or they do, and it goes nowhere. Um, I'm not even talking about one-hit wonders. I'm talking about, like, artists who are, like, 
on the fucking map. Like they're doing the complex interviews and they're big and they have shows. And then all of a sudden they just can't get any semblance of traction again. Um, and it comes down to three things that I've noticed. There's several factors, but the three main factors that I've noticed are one, uh, a bad team, two, bad A&Rs, and three, the most common, is they feel like they can write their own songs themselves, and they're the visionary genius, and they don't need any help. And they think that, well, I had a hit record before. I'm the sauce behind the record. I don't need anybody. I don't need a writer. I don't need to work with a writer. And I'm just going to use my producers that I've been using, my homies, because I don't want to. I don't want to pay fees that's coming out of my budget, or I just don't want to pay anybody. And it's usually two of the three of these things, but most of the time, it's three out of three. Let me explain this. Let's talk about the life cycle of an artist today. What normally happens? You're an independent artist. You're trying desperately to go viral on TikTok, usually, but on social media. Um, so you're posting videos. You're posting videos. Bop, bop, bop. You're just, you either get lucky. It can happen quickly. I mean, you can have something pick up quick out of nowhere. It's the first song you've ever recorded. All of a sudden, you got a viral song. Or you've been working at it for a long time, and you finally break through. You have a hit, right? And... What will happen as your song is gaining traction and you're getting bigger, the labels will start calling you. And the labels will say, hey, congrats on going viral. We want to offer you a deal because we think we can take your career to the next level. You've already done this on your own and it's so impressive and congratulations. We're going to give you a big bag of money and we're going to be the marketing tool that you need to keep you on top and take you to that next level. Now, these deals usually suck. You've done the work. You've done their job for them. They, you already did it. You built a following. You have a hit record, right? And the problem is these young, usually they're young artists, and they don't realize they have leverage. And they usually don't have good music attorneys or music attorneys at all. So they'll sign a shitty deal with a label. Now, sometimes it still works out because you are, you have the sauce. You're Ice Spice. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you're Ice Spice. And I don't know the, the I don't know what kind of deal she signed. She's got a great manager. I actually know her manager um, and her A&R. So she obviously does not fall in, in these categories. But you're not, most people aren't Ice Spice. They don't have the sauce to make it through no matter what. They don't have the star power. They just had a fucking catchy ass hit song that moved on TikTok. They sign a deal to the label because the label's going to recoup their money no matter what on that song. So they're playing with house money, right? Now, the label says, okay, your next song. Odds are all the music that you have recorded is not good enough they're not going to think it's good enough because it's probably not. You now are on. You have to deliver another hit. If you the next song you drop sucks, you're done. That's it. So now there's pressure. And the label feels that pressure. And so the label is going to want to put you in with other artists other songwriters, other producers to get that next hit record. A lot of times, the artist thinks, I don't need it. I'm not cutting that bullshit. I'm a real artist. I write my own records. <laughs> yeah, you do. There's a difference between being a good songwriter and a hit songwriter. In 2023... You need hits. We don't give a fuck that you can rap well. We don't give a fuck that you have a good voice. You need hit songs. And a good team, a good A&R, can deliver those to you. 
and they know how to talk to an artist and they know how to reason with them and they know how to explain, hey, look, you're not any less of an artist because you work with very talented, good people. You're not any less of an artist because you take a hit song. Are you fucking dumb? You don't want a hit? You need a hit. They did it for you. You're j when you're an artist, just be an artist. You know what I mean? You don't have to be an artist and a prolific songwriter. You don't have to be Beyonce and Diane Warren. Just be Beyonce. Okay? You can, I mean, have input. You're, you, you know, you want to like co-write your songs, be a part of the process, sure. But artists, I see it time and time again where they'll be popping. They'll, they'll, maybe they'll even have three hits. They're, they have a successful album. And then they think, okay, well, <laughs> good job, me. Nice work, me. Remember when I did all this by myself? I got it now. And I want this for the next. And I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to work with these producers that I like. And I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to write it myself. Yeah. It sounds like it. Um, so that's my thoughts on that. Artists, work with songwriters, okay? It's not just me saying it as a songwriter. This is just what, I, again, as a business guy, as somebody who's been in the fucking music business for a long time and has seen this and this from artists. And again, I've also seen in most cases with successful artists that I work with, they work with writers. They work with great collaborators. You know, Drake got a whole bunch of shit because it came out that Drake was taking hooks and was, well, no fucking shit. Of course he fucking was. Because he's a goat. That's what goats do. The greats recognize other greats and collaborate with other greats and work with other greats and, and off-put things that they don't have time to be doing. You know what I'm saying? When you're touring and doing promo and fucking working out and whatever the fuck you got to do with it as an artist, you don't have time to be in the studio writing a record a day. These songwriters are dropping, they're, they're, they're recording eight, nine songs a week sometimes. They're psychopaths because that's how you got to make money as an artist. It's a volume game. They're writing so many records. You don't have time. And when you're a popping artist, you get the best music from everybody. Everybody's sending you your best, their best. It's like if you were a, a fucking Quentin Tarantino and in the new Tarantino movie, you're like, man, I'm going to cast my own actors instead of fucking DiCaprio and, you know, whatever. Mm. <sighs> Should just have a, uh, or they could just use ChatGPT, <laughs> right? To write, uh, to write their songs for them. <sighs> People who think that like ChatGPT is going to take over the creative like you're a fucking idiot. You think Chat G you think Chat GPT is gonna take over songwriting? Yeah. Or you think Chat GPT is gonna take over like art? There's gonna be no more there's gonna be no more artists because AI is gonna like you don't it's let's do let's do this. Let's go to Chat GPT. Let's have Chat GPT write us a song. Huh? I got time. How much time am I at? Yeah, I got time. Let's fucking do it. Okay. Write me a song about going through a tough breakup with someone you loved but had to let go. Okay. No. Oh. <laughs> I mean this. Okay. Ready? <clears throat> I thought we had it all. We were the perfect match. But then we hit a wall, and things started to detach. The love we had was real, but it wasn't enough to heal. The wounds that we had, and now we're both so sad. That's verse one. Now, that's a piece of shit, right? That song sucks. Uh, let's keep going. I'm not done. 
chorus. <laughs> going through a tough breakup with someone I love so true. It hurts to let you go, but it's what we had to do. Now, those things rhyme, right? And it makes sense. It's a ter- It sounds like the first song anybody ever wrote when they were 12, and they're like, I'm going to write a song. What else? Outro. Going through a tough breakup, it's never easy to do. But I know that in time, we'll both make it through. We'll find happiness again, and our hearts will mend. You're concerned about that? You're concerned that AI is going to take your job as a songwriter? <laughs> now, AI is going to get better, right? Um, eventually, it will be able to create better music um and there's some incredible stuff being done with ai music i work in ai this is i can i can say this stuff guys i'm an expert right i work in ai specifically ai music um it's not gonna take your job unless you're like a copywriter or you it's gonna take a lot of jobs um i should rephrase this whole thing let me start over AI is going to take a lot of jobs, and a lot of you should be scared. But creatives, uh, you need not fear, and you need to not be a dinosaur. Don't be a fucking boomer about it. You need to to be using, if you're not using ChatGPT right now, I know you've heard this from everywhere, and you've read all the articles, and you've seen the fucking clickbait, and the... Listen to me. I'm going to grab the microphone for dramatic effect and really lean in here. If you're not using chat GPT right now, you're a fucking idiot. There it is. This is a game-changing tool, and you're doing yourself a disservice by not using it. You are your parents now. You are now your parents when the internet came out. Or when, you know, fucking TikTok came out or Twitter came out. You're your parents. I'm not using that chat GPT. That's how you sound when you say it. I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not using that AI bullshit. I'm what? Because I'm, because you're too lazy to do it yourself. No, dude, you're missing the point. Use it. It's an incredible tool. It's, I mean, look, this thing is fucking amazing. And another thing. Um, AI is not going to take over the world yet. It could happen. But this version of AI uh, is not going to... There's two different kinds. Of, okay, so there's narrow AI and there's general AI. This is narrow AI. You, write, you give it a prompt, you write, it gives you... An, you give it an input, it gives you an output. General AI is like what you see in her and in Ex Machina and in the movies where AI can like think for itself and can generate its own intellectual task. We're so far away from that. Not that far, but we're far away. And you don't have to worry about it yet. We'll cross that bridge when we get to it, right? But for now, use it. It's amazing. And also, you need to learn how to use it. Um, it's not just like Google. You don't just hop on and it's like, oh, tell me the best, you know, you can. Tell me the best list of recipe. It's like you need to talk to it like you're talking to a person. Like make it your assistant, you know. Hey, Chad GPT, you're going to be my personal chef as I work on my meal prep for da 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 these are my dietary restrictions, and these are the things I like to eat. Now, what, you know, what are some healthy, good meals that I can make for this week under $400 at the grocery store? Make me a fucking meal plan. Boom. It'll do it in eight seconds. You're not using that? Hey, ChatGPT, um, I want to make a website for my business. I have no fucking idea how to do that. 
you are my business associate who's going to teach me how to make a fucking website. What's the most efficient, quickest, cheapest way to make a website for my business? Boom. There it is. Nine fucking seconds. Oh, um, I'd like to actually have a thing where I can have a cart, a shopping cart. How do I add that? Boom. There, it, it's, you're, you're not using that? Additionally, if you're a creative... You can use it to spark new ideas. You know, uh, prompts. G g give me some inspiration. What are some titles for blah, 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 blah? What are, you know what I mean? You, you, you need to be using it. I, look, I don't want to... It's the first episode. I don't want to be super, like, AI. Meh, meh, meh. But it's, it's like... It's like auto-tune. Ready for an analogy? When auto-tune came out, all the old head musicians and like incredible singers were like, auto tune's gonna be the, the end of music. Auto tune's the worst thing to happen to music. It fucking Jay Z, the goat, had a song called Death of Auto Tune. You remember that? Death of Auto Tune? Because everyone was threatened and thought, oh, well, now real singers, what's the point of even having a good voice? Everybody can have a good voice. Wrong! Anybody can use auto-tune to be in tune, right? You can use auto-tune to be in tune. If you can't sing, you can use auto-tune. But if you're an incredible singer, all auto-tune does is make you sound better. It's a tool. It heightens the experience. It helps you. It's great. And now everybody uses auto-tune. Adele uses auto-tune. It's a complementary tool to make your art better. And that's what AI is if you're an artist. It will help you. It will make you better. It will tighten the skill gap a little bit. So if you are Future, who when he first started using Autotune couldn't sing for shit, right? But he still sounded cool and dope. It's him with Travis. It'll, it'll, it'll tighten the skill gap, which is good. It gives people the tools that they otherwise wouldn't have, whether they're in a third world country or they're whatever. You now have the tools to be successful, where otherwise you wouldn't. Um, yeah, so anyway, we'll have a whole AI episode. How about that? Uh, there's one other thing I wanted to talk about. Mm. Um... You guys watch women's basketball? No, probably not. But if you've been following uh, the tournament at all, or if you've been, watched the news one time, there is a athlete named Caitlin Clark on Iowa who was kind of this out of nowhere exciting story for women's college basketball because she was a shit talker and she was cold. She was getting buckets. She was dropping 40. She was hitting these Steph Curry threes. She And she's a shit talker. So she's Iowa. Boom. They're going through the tournament. Kaylin Clark's going crazy. They're upsetting everybody. She's going nuts. And she's talking cash shit the whole time. She's hitting the fucking John Cena. Hits a three in, hits a, three in a bitch's face. John... Waves off a girl at the three-point line. She's like, go ahead, shoot it. You're not going to make it. Just go. She sags all the way back into the key. Go ahead. You got it. She's spooked. Doesn't shoot it. Passes the ball. She's talking shit, and the media is eating this shit up. They are loving it. They're like, Caitlin Clark is her. I mean, if you're on TikTok, you saw this stuff too. All the fucking commentary from everybody. Caitlin Clark is her. She's the best thing to happen to college basketball. And she is. She's going nuts. Then... She gets to the championship game. And they face LSU. And they get fucking popped. They get... I mean, it was an ass whooping. Um, I mean, it wasn't insane, but it was over, right? It was not a... LSU was... They won convincingly. Now, they have a center 
named Angel Reese, who is a black girl. And I should have prefaced this. Caitlin Clark, white girl. Angel Reese, black girl. When the game was over, very much out of hand, Angel Reese jogs up to Caitlin Clark and goes like that <laughs> to her. And then goes like this. Basically like, I got a ring. You don't. We won. Now, I think that is fucking hilarious and awesome. Caitlin Clark, you're a shit talker. You've been talking shit, which again, awesome. Great. And Caitlin Clark dropped like 30 that game. She went crazy. But if you talk shit, you got to be able to take it. So Angel Reese, who also talked shit and balled out and won, went up to her and was like, eh, yeah. <laughs> scoreboard type shit, right? That's it. That should have been the end of it because that's it. The game's over. LSU wins. Everything's great. Blah, 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 blah. But instead, instead, what do you think happened? Well, what happened is everybody starts going uh, classless. Angel Reese, have some sportsmanship. Have some, oh, yeah? <laughs> so what we're doing on this show, I'm going to have a segment every week called the F-O-H-H-O-F, which is cool. Uh, I don't, it's a nanogram. What's it called when something's the same backwards? Anyway, it stands for the fuck out of here Hall of Fame. Every week, I'm going to induct a new member into the FOHHOF. And the first inductee is none other than Dave Portnoy. Because what does Dave Portnoy do after this happens? He goes on Twitter and he calls Angel Reese a classless piece of shit now let me preface this I don't got I don't got an issue with Dave Portnoy you know he's a hell of an entrepreneur he's funny sometimes but don't you fucking dare be Dave Portnoy and have Barstool Sports <laughs> your platform and start calling people classless what? The obvious thing to say here is the racial undertones. Oh, the white girl does it, and everyone's fucking calling her a queen, and she's her, blah, 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 blah. And then Angel Reese does it, and all of a sudden, you know, what a classless, no sportsmanship. And you know what? They're right. It is that. Whether Dave Portnoy and all the other pundits who said that kind of thing me meant it that way, it is that way. And you know what? On this podcast, we don't dance around the hard-hitting, scary things to talk about. We're not worried about the taboo. We're going to fucking talk about it. Okay? It is that way. And... Shit talking is a part of sports. You don't know what Caitlin Clark said to Angel Reese during the game. You don't know what she said to her friend. Who t it doesn't matter. When you're playing sports or doing anything competitive for that matter, talk shit is a part of it. And unless you've played sports, you don't know that. But that's just how it works. So this isn't just Dave. Really anybody who had this take from it should be inducted into the fuck out of here Hall of Fame this week. If you saw that, and instead of laughing or being like, ah, nicely done, you got her, and you're, instead your thought was, wow, have some sportsmanship. Respect the game. You will also be inducted to the fuck out of here Hall of Fame. And please comment below if you're one of those people. Uh, because fuck out of here, you know? Fuck out of here. Anyway. Mm. Wow, what a fun first episode this has been, huh? Guys? I mean, we did it. Uh, the first one I feel like is uh, is the scariest, you know? 
Uh, it's it's kind of like you're ripping the Band-Aid off. And uh, this is kind of what you can expect every week. Me talking, some, telling, you, telling you some shit about my week, uh, talking about what's going on in the world, and uh, just talking shit. And uh, we're going to do this every week. And uh, what else? I'm just, I'm going over, uh, let me see, I got a little, some notes here. And uh, no, that's it. We did it. We talked about everything. I mean, I'm fucking crushing it, guys. Are you kidding me? Am I the, am I the, am, is this the best first podcast ever recorded? Did I do it? I think so. Liquid Death, if you're interested, um, you can go ahead and just email me. Wouldn't blame you. Um, that's going to be it. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining me, guys, on, uh, on good luck. And, uh. Good luck. Okay. We'll see you next week. Good night and good luck. You smile and say goodbye to me, but I don't give a fuck. You hop in the Uber, off to your future. Good night and good luck. You try to play your cards with me, but I'm calling your bluff. Cause it wasn't enough. Mm.